From the nation's capital, the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research presents Public Policy Forums, a series of programs featuring the nation's top authorities presenting their differing views on the vital issues which confront us. Today's topic, the Constitution and the Budget Process. This Public Policy Forum, one of a series presented by the American Enterprise Institute, will examine the constitutional division of responsibility between the President and the Congress for formulating and implementing a federal budget. Our subject, the Constitution and the budget process. The Constitution, as many of you will know from civics in high school, stipulates that Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States to borrow money on the credit of the United States and to coin money and regulate its value. In the now historic tradition of checks and balances in our constitutional system, the President has a qualified veto over legislation, and at least two-thirds vote in both houses of the Congress is required to override. The Founding Fathers, however, said nothing as to whether or not the veto power might be taken against the, a part of the bill or could only be applied to an entire bill. It is a question which looms large in considering budget reforms today, and it has been with us over a hundred years. Well, the modern era in the budget process really began in 1921 with a Budget and Accounting Act described as a turning point in executive legislative budget relations. In the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, further refinement and modification sought more efficient and effective budget methods, among them a mandated legislative budget each year by February 15th. That lasted two years. And a single omnibus appropriation bill. That lasted one year. Finally, in 1974, the impounding of some $18 billion appropriated in congressional spending bills by President Nixon triggered the Congressional Budget and Impounding Control Act. Now, more than a decade later, the 1974 Act has been found wanting by many who have participated in the budget process in the Senate and the House, and by those who have observed there and the general frustration with the process, the deficits, the huge public debt, and the chaotic efforts to establish viable and effective spending priorities. Now, to examine this modernization, and measure its effectiveness and what still needs to be done, we have a distinguished and expert panel. On my far right is Representative Dick Cheney, Republican of Wyoming. Mr. Cheney served in the Ford administration as assistant to the President and White House Chief of Staff. He is chairman of the House Republican Policy Committee and is a member of the House Committee on Interior and Insular Affairs. On my immediate right, Dr. James C. Miller III, Director of the Office of Management and Budget, formerly Chairman of the Federal Trade Commission, and an AEI resident scholar and co-director of the American Enterprise Institute Center for the Study of Government Regulation. On my immediate left, Representative Leon E. Panetta, Democrat from California's 16th District. Representative Panetta served for six years on the House Budget Committee was a leading participant in the budget-making process in President Reagan's first term, and he served as the chairman of the Budget Committee's Task Force on Reconciliation. On my far left, Dr. Norman Ornstein, resident scholar of the American Enterprise Institute and a visiting professor of political science at John Hopkins University. Well, first, gentlemen, I would pose the same question to each of you in turn. After 10 years of trial and testing and keeping constitutional provisions in mind, does the 1974 Budget Act history give us any hope of a solution to our chronic failure to control and prudently manage and plan public spending and revenue raising as we expect every element of the private sector down to the family unit to do? Dr. Miller. I believe that there is some hope, but that hope is uh, evaporating fast. Uh, we have had uh, some successes with the Budget Act, I think giving the uh, Congressional Budget Office uh, resources that help uh, congressmen and senators has been good. But the basic trading off of resources between appropriations accounts has not proven to be as was advertised. Secondly, 
we have had, uh, rather than uh, completing the process on time, even if there was, even with an additional three months, uh, not a single appropriations bill was ready for the President's signature by the beginning of the uh, fiscal year. And finally, let me say that the budget deficit has grown leaps and bounds. So the control over the budget process, I think, uh, is in some doubt at this moment. Mr. Panetta. I think what's been shown uh, over the years is that uh, while you can put a process in place, that process alone is not the answer to dealing with budget issues, that you still need the courage to make tough choices and you need the leadership to uh, make the tough choices. The problem with the uh, budget process that was uh, put in place in 1974 is that it worked relatively well when the choices were relatively easy. But now when you've got to either cut defense, raise taxes, or cut cost of living indexes for Social Security recipients, the, pro the process bogs down. I think the point is this. You can put any kind of process you want in place, but unless there's courage to make tough choices and unless there's leadership both from the President as well as the Congress, the deficit continues to go up. Mr. Cheney. I would uh, concur with Mr. Panetta's judgment. I think what we've learned uh, is that the, the 1974 Act hasn't worked uh, for many of the reasons Jim cites. Uh, it seems to me that any statutory process that is approved ultimately requires uh, the creation of a working majority on the floor of the House and the Senate in order to implement it. And without that majority, without that consensus of at least 50 percent of the members plus one, uh, no statutory process appears to solve the problem. The frustration is so great that uh, it's led to the kinds of efforts we saw in the last session of Congress with respect to Graham Redmond to make cuts automatic and uh, of course has led to a uh, fundamental debate about whether or not we ought to amend the Constitution to fundamentally change those authorities so that we can in fact deal with the problem. All right, Dr. Ornstein. Well, I think the budget process is clearly an improvement on what existed before, and the process works better than it would if we uh, did not have such a process in place now. Uh, our, my colleagues are absolutely right. The problem is not the process. It is a natural American inclination to look to changing the process or tinkering with it if we uh, have a more fundamental difficulty. The fundamental difficulty is not just a lack of leadership or a lack of consensus among the elites in priorities. It's also that we don't have a consensus out in the public as to what the problem is, much less what our priorities ought to be. And ours is a system that's designed not to act, not to take deep steps, unless we have such a consensus. Uh, it, we have to find a way to find that consensus, uh, not just tinker with the, uh, uh, with the process. Well, now, there have been two main approaches in proposals to deal with our budget problem. One would limit the size and growth of the federal budget by constitutional amendment. The other would change and improve existing law by revising congressional procedures in the budget process. Uh, the Graham-Rudman-Hollings bill has already been mentioned. Now, roughly, it requires a balanced budget by 1991, would require automatic uh, reductions of major elements of the budget if the deficit exceeds the annual targets to bring a balanced budget by 1991. Dr. Miller, you said at the AEI annual policy week that President Reagan plans to propose a fiscal 1987 budget with a maximum deficit of $144 billion. <coughs> it's the same target. It's in the 19... 87 limit of the Graham Rudman Hollings bill. Are there reservations? Well, the president is very uh, concerned about the overall level of the deficit. He believes it important to get it back down. Uh, he believes that the Graham Rudman theory, the, uh, the, the, the action forcing events uh, to force the budget down, the budget deficit down, is the way to go. Uh, he thinks that uh, we have uh, too high expenditures in many domestic programs. There's a lot of pork out there that uh, needs to be taken away. There are programs that do not benefit the vast majority of taxpayers. What they do is they benefit a special interest. And uh, those ought to be taken away. But you know, it is very difficult uh, for an elected official to come to, co to Congress and not bring home the pork. Uh, it's even more difficult for them to come to Congress and lose the pork that they have. It's extraordinarily difficult to have a social compact in which congressmen and senators will all agree uh, to reduce levels of spending. No one wants to give up their piece of pork unless everyone else is giving up theirs. The advantage of a Graham Rudman Hollings approach is it forces a social compact among the congressmen and senators and with the President of the United States, which would then lower that budget deficit. But Jim, with, with all due respect, and I don't, uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm a Republican, I'm a strong supporter of Ronald Reagan's, uh, 
Uh, I would take offense, though, at the notion that somehow all congressmen are concerned only about pork. No. I'm or that they, they, they are, are not willing to make those difficult decisions mm -hmm. and cast those tough votes. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, and I've agreed with the president's spending priorities, the fact of the matter is there's a fundamental difference of opinion in the country at large, reflected in the Congress, between the two parties, between the houses, and between Congress and, and uh, the president over what those priorities ought to be. And uh, much as I uh, like and admire and respect Ronald Reagan, mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is in the past, when it's been time to put together a budget package in the Congress, uh, the president uh, sits down and takes defense off the table and he just says, that's not an mm -hmm. item, we're not going to cut defense. The Democrats in the Congress take the domestic programs off the table right. and we're not going to cut those. Mm -hmm. Both parties run to see who can be first to take Social Security off the table. We're not going <laughs> to cut that. Right. So all that's left to negotiate over is the deficit. Yeah. And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But the fact of the matter is, it's not just Congress that, that has a set of priorities that are, quote, pork. I mean, if we uh, many of us uh, have strong feelings about... Uh, uh, programs and the direction of the priorities that we think ought to be established. Right. Sometimes those disagree with the president, but uh, I wouldn't want to leave our uh, our audience with the view that somehow Congress cares about pork and the president cares no, about fiscal no. responsibility. No, there, no. There are obviously uh, many things to consider, and there are some different priorities. We've gone through an election, though, in 1984, in which the president carried all states but one. Mm -hmm. And uh, questions about tax increase, for example, arguably was settled there. So I think there is some uh, perception uh, among the public, and the polls tend to show that that uh, there is a need to deal with the budget deficit, okay. and and there and there is not uh, and there's not enthusiasm for do it, dealing with it by increasing taxes. And so it seems to me that what we've got to do is look where we can uh, reduce that spending. Mr. Benetta. Well, I, I just uh, I think to follow up on what Dick. Uh, uh, Dick's comments. First of all, I don't think you can reach $200 billion deficits and not have everybody share the blame, uh, whether it's Republican administrations or Democratic administrations, uh, or for that matter, uh, the House, Senate, uh, and the President. You just don't get to that number and have everybody not somewhat responsible because of their own particular set of priorities. I think it is true, however, that in trying to deal with that size deficit, the problem is that you have to look at the nature of the budget we're dealing with. The federal budget now, which now approaches almost a trillion dollars, 85 percent of it goes to basically three areas. Uh, almost 12, 10 to 12 percent is now going to interest payments on the debt, you know, which is one of the fastest growing areas of the federal budget. About 46 percent goes to entitlement programs, largely retirement and pension mm -hmm. programs, along with uh, agricultural programs. And now about uh, close to 30, 32 percent uh, is going to defense spending. Uh, you can shut down the rest of the, of the federal budget and you still run deficits of almost $150, $160 billion. So the problem is you've got to address three areas. You've got to address defense, you've got to address entitlements, and you have to address the issue of revenues. If you don't put that kind of package together, we're never going to accomplish anything on the deficit. And that's where I think Dick's right. Everybody's bogged down on that issue. The president hasn't moved on taxes or defense. Democrats or Congress hasn't moved on in entitlements. And the deficit goes up. And that's the core of the problem that we're facing. Dr. Ornstein. It's, it's a problem that goes beyond the question of, of uh, pork in many other ways. The president doesn't consider defense to be pork. Obviously, he wants a sizable increase uh, and for some very good reasons. There aren't very many Americans who would consider most of those entitlement programs, which are direct benefit mm -hmm. payments to individuals, pork. We don't think of Social Security as pork. We don't think of Medicare as pork. We don't think of veterans pensions or veterans health uh, as, uh, as pork. Interest on the debt, obviously, is something that is off the table. So what have we got left? As Congressman Panetta suggested, that's 15 percent of the budget. Now, that includes the FBI. Is that pork? I don't think so. Most people wouldn't consider that to be pork. Medicaid or food stamps? Some might. They're not very large items. When we get down to what the common definition of pork is, which gets an enormous amount of attention, not only has it gone down sharply in real terms in the last several years, while these other items have gone up very sharply, but there's very little left there. You can eliminate every dam, every bridge, every river and, river and harbor project, uh, every one of those items that would meet the common definition of pork, and we're going to have a deficit that's still staggering by historical standards. Uh, it, it's uh, not a question of simply getting rid of those things that people consider either pork or waste, fraud, and abuse by common definition. There are tough decisions. There is no consensus on priorities. And finally, we have to realize that you've got a public out there that believes, among other things, by and large, that it's morning in America, that things are doing very well. Thank you very much.
And if we're talking about making decisions that are extremely tough, not just getting rid of waste, fraud, and pork, uh, they're not in the mood at this point to take that uh, enormous pain. And our institutions by the founding fathers were not set up to enable politicians, no matter how courageous, except under very extraordinary circumstances with a total consensus uh, that they have, to make tough decisions that bring enormous pain to large numbers of people if they're feeling uh, out of the mood to uh, accept that pain. Well, now we're addressing the fundamental issue of whether the corrections that are necessary <clears throat> and indicated can only be achieved by constitutional amendment. Is a constitutional method the only method that there is left? I uh, have reached the point where I'm prepared to support a constitutional amendment that would in fact make it more difficult to spend money. Some people talk about uh, uh, requiring a balanced budget. Uh, that's got a nice ring to it. Uh, realistically, I think that's extremely hard to implement, but I think we could uh, move the Constitution in the direction of saying that, that uh, before you can run a deficit, you've got to have at least a 65 or or 60 percent majority in both houses of Congress to approve that. Uh, make it uh, to be the kind of extraordinary step that it is, the kind of important policy decision it is, as uh, uh, we now require a two-thirds majority to, uh, to ratify a Senate treaty, for example. But John, but, uh, but Dick, that's exactly what I was talking about when I used the example of pork. What I mean is it is very difficult for congressmen and senators to resist those pressures from back but, home but it's to not, spend more. And, Jim, and, and I would, I would that argue that, that there are a number of us in the House, Republicans specifically and some Democrats, who voted more often to cut the budget than Ronald Reagan mm -hmm. would if he'd been there. Mm -hmm. That uh, we've oftentimes uh, taken a more conservative right. stance right. on spending than the President has. It's right. not just a matter of members of Congress responding to back home pressures. Right. The pressures I feel and I care about and that I try to respond to cut the budget. Well, I'm we do it time after time after sure. time. Now, the president, whatever process you talk about, whether you talk about constitutional amendment or Graham Redmond or any other alternative, the bottom line is the president's going to have to make some tough decisions, too. One of the features of Graham Redmond is uh, that the president, in effect, ends up in a situation where he has to decide between defense, yeah. entitlements, and taxes, because the deficit option is eliminated. The same thing is true if you go with a constitutional amendment uh, with respect to a balanced budget. If you eliminate the deficit as an option, then you're back down to deciding what are you going to do on entitlements, what are you going to do on defense, and what are you going to do on revenues is the only way to satisfy that requirement. But what I'm saying is that for the reasons that we both described, there is an institutional bias that needs to be corrected. And Graham Rudman Hollings is an institutional way of correcting this bias. It forces the Congress and, and the, the President, president right. and the President right. to make those tough choices. And a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution a kind that you were talking about, say, with a supermajority of Congress would be required to increase expending more than, uh, more than revenue, uh, is a similar institutional kind of uh, approach to this. It would ensure that for, for a long period of time that uh, there would be a writing, uh, a meeting of this institutional bias. The, pro the problem is that uh, in, in either event, I think Graham Rudman, Rudman is considered a crude tool, and it is a crude tool. It was born in frustration over the failure to, to basically deal with the issues we talked about. Anyone who's dealt with the budget knows that you take a, an across-the-board approach, you are not taking a careful approach to dealing with the federal budget, that there are some priorities that demand more, there are some areas that demand less. Across-the-board cuts are not that responsible. So it's a club to try to force the institution to do what, uh, what it otherwise ought to be doing. I think the problem, I sense, is that our forefathers really intended that we as representatives be accountable to the public. If, if we aren't reducing the deficit, then by God, public ought to vote us out of office, including the president. If, on the other hand, there's a sense that somehow the public continues to support the programs that Congress and the president are supporting, then you can put every amendment in the world into place, and you're not going to change very much. I mean, that's my concern about the arguments over a balanced budget amendment is that somehow it conveys the impression that simply by enacting that process it'll solve our problems. My fear is that that process can be as abused as the present budget process. You can take a balanced budget amendment, get, the, put, get that put in place, and before you know it we begin to take things off budget. There's a move now to take Social Security off budget. There'll be a move to take defense off budget. We take the Strategic Petroleum Reserve off budget. And the effort then will be to reduce the, the area that you're dealing with. You won't have resolved the deficit issue. You'll just play shadow games.
We've gotten quickly to, to some fundamentals here, and they're, they're worth pursuing. And one is the question of whether there is, in fact, a deep institutional bias that Jim suggested. And I know Jim relies to a degree on the public choice literature, which, which has all kinds of formal models suggesting this tremendous internal bias in Congress to spend on these concrete projects of benefits to individuals. Uh, and, of course, the, mo the broader question of a bias of a democratic polity to spend, spend, spend. I would argue that that bias, in fact, is not there. That we have 180 years of history in which we had fundamentally the same institutions where, by and large, with the exception of the major wars, we had a budget that was pretty close to being in balance. We had many, many years of surpluses uh, uh, going with years uh, unavoidably of deep def deficits for the most part, but, uh, but where we got pretty close to being in balance. The problem has been in the last 20 years. Right. Now, I'm not sure, first of all, that you could argue that there has been a structural change in the last 20 years that would bring that about, but more than that, that literature suggests that the increase in spending that is built in that's going to mushroom dramatically is in precisely those areas in the last 20 years that have gone down. They've gone down in real terms, they've gone down dramatically as a, as a portion of the budget. The areas that have gone up are those areas that are removed, are insulated from the ability of congressmen to claim credit. You can't go out there and say, I take credit for the automatic cost of living adjustment that you get in your Social Security. Why did we make those changes? Did Congress make them uh, for bad reasons or good? Congress enacted automatic cost of living adjustments in Social Security and other entitlement programs precisely to cut spending because we were getting, in a year-by-year -year process, increases in those cost of living adjustments that were going well beyond inflation. It was with all the right motives. And it raises the second question. It was a reform implemented for all the right reasons with good meaning, but of course, reforms inevitably fit into the iron law of unintended consequences. Nobody anticipated the inflation we had in the 1970s that tremendously increased those entitlement costs that have made them now 40-some percent of the budget. When we talk about these structural changes, when I think about a constitutional amendment, as Dick Cheney has suggested, that would retard spending by requiring a supermajority, I can just begin to think of the multiple number of unintended consequences of minorities in Congress using this as a lever where with a third of the membership, they can bring the country to a halt to get a whole series of other objectives uh, that they might want to achieve. I can think of millions of unintended consequences that could result from a crude tool like Graham Rudman. Okay, you don't like procedural changes, you don't like constitutional changes, what's your solution to the problem? Let me, let me answer that. I think the... <laughs> I, 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 I yield to my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> let me give you a political answer because right. I think that's where it's at. The fact is, everybody understands that to deal with a very tough problem of the deficit, the size of the deficit we're dealing with, you've got to take the president, the speaker, and the majority leader of the Senate, put them in the same room, and develop that consensus package in the areas of defense, entitlements, and taxes that has to be arrived at. That's the name of the game in our process. That's where leadership would be involved, and that's where courage would be involved, is to come up with that kind of solution not to hide in the trenches. Everybody is playing chicken on this issue. Well, uh, and that's a, that's a basic problem. So what do, what do we do? Instead of saying to the president and to the leadership, you've got to try to resolve the issue, we come up with a process solution that's used as a club to force the president to do what he should be doing anyway. Well, well how, how much support has, has Representative <laughs> Jones' uh, suggestion of an economic sum summit had? I think it makes a great deal of sense. But I think that's what, what we, we ought to be pushing as a vehicle to try to find a common sense answer to this. Not putting process uh, procedures into place that may force a whole set of unforeseen consequences that nobody wants or intends. I mean, that's, that's what people elect people to office for, to try to come up with those kinds of answers. We do that in the event of war. We do that in the event of other crises. We've got a budget crisis on our hands. I think it's time for urgent action at a leadership level. But part of our problem, and we've had these before, this isn't a new suggestion. No, we had the group no. of 17, we had the Rose sure. Garden agreements. I can't even count all the agreements we've had in recent years. And you do exactly that. You get the speaker or his representatives in the room, the president and his representatives in the room, sit down and talk. Sometimes the meetings go on endlessly. They've been at Jim Baker's house in the middle of the night, and they've been in the White House and Blair House and all over town. Nothing but meetings. And we get all through, <clears throat> what happens is, the deficit suffers because we Democrats get what they want on domestic spending. Nobody's going to touch entitlements. The president gets what he wants on defense. We add up the numbers, $200 billion deficit. Oh, well, next year we'll try better. And what we're suggesting is that maybe, 
through the constitutional amendment process, through Graham Rudman, if by no other means, we can take the deficit off the table and say, hey guys, that's not negotiable anymore. Sit down and talk. We want an agreement. We want a summit accord of some kind, but you're not allowed anymore to do what you've done in the past, which is to say, well, we'll just take it out of the deficit. Dr. Could, could, could I just summarize? I think where we are right now is that we have two notions or two theories to explain a malady. One is that we have the wrong people, or the people there are not sufficiently strong in making the tough choices. And the other is an institutional bias. And I think I tend toward, as, as Norm uh, characterized accurately, toward the institutional bias mode. And uh, I would ask you, how can you explain the fact that if the institution is neutral with respect to deficits for 24 of the last 25 years, 24 of 25 years we've experienced deficits. I don't think that the people every year have been the wrong kind of people. We've had a lot of different presidents in the past 25 years. We've had a lot of members of different members of Congress and a lot of different uh, members of the Senate, but yet we have run a deficit 24 of the last 25 years. I think clear I don't think it's an institutional phenomenon. I think we have run deficits as many other western democracies have in part because our norms have changed. Maybe it's because of modern economics. Uh, maybe it's a whole set of other reasons. Our norms have changed, and we went through a period of time where we didn't see deficits as necessarily being as bad as, they, as we did see them perhaps in the 19th century. Some of it clearly is paying a price for bad decisions made in the 1960s where we thought we could have guns and butter and both. We clearly paid a price for that. Some of it is wrong decisions made for the right reasons, perhaps like the indexing of entitlements. But when I look at many of the solutions that are uh, proposed, constitutional ones in particular, those solutions suggest it's the people in Congress who have that bias. Let's give more power to the president. Let's give him the line item veto. Let's give him more authority. When I look at what's happened in other Western democracies, particularly parliamentary systems that have enormous increased authority for the executive, what I see is a spending bias much worse. It's but, my but, belief that that's a solution that essentially is saying uh, we've tried everything else, let's try suicide. Maybe but that'll a, a work. A line item veto is not a radical idea. I mean, 43 out of the 50 governors do, in fact, today have that authority. Why not give it to the president? But, Dick, you understand that on a line item veto, what would be subject to a line item veto is about 15 percent of the federal budget. It's, I the, mean, defense, it's the defense you, budget as well. Well, but, but a large part of the defense budget and long-term contracts would be not subject to it, and uh, Ronald Reagan really. certainly wouldn't use his line item I veto on the defense you, budget. I won't argue with you that the line oh, item yes, veto, that the line item veto, uh, isn't all the cure you. for all our problems. It's not going to solve every single problem. It would be some additional authority that the president would have that would allow him to impose some additional discipline on the process. I don't think that's wrong. I think it's sound. My only suggestion uh, is that Norm's argument that somehow the line item veto is a radical departure doesn't hold water in light of the fact that 43 out of 50 governors already have that authority. I, well, but it I, goes I, beyond that, doesn't it, really? I mean, we, we've got a long history from the 1880s right up to now you had very strong support for the line item veto. Grant, Hayes, Arthur, FDR, Truman, Eisenhower. And the Congress itself gave to the governors of our territories a line item veto right, which they will deny to the White House. Well, I'm not surprised to find that presidents have wanted a line item veto authority uh, up through history. I'd be surprised if we found one who didn't. I'm not surprised that Dick thinks a line item veto is a good idea. He spent time in the White House and he has a presidential <laughs> perspective. And I imagine Jim thinks it's a good idea too. I believe a line item veto is not going to provide discipline for spending. There's no evidence in the states that suggests that it does. Uh, indeed, I believe that presidents have more of a bias for spending. They're there for a short period of time. They want to do things. They want to get things done. No president is immune from that. What the line item veto does, having control over a very small portion of the budget, is to, uh, but a portion of the budget that does matter, as Jim suggests, to members of Congress. Even if it's diminishing, it matters a great deal. It gives the power, the uh, president, the power, almost a blackmail authority that he can use to accomplish other goals with the Congress. If Ronald Reagan had the line item veto authority, he would not be using it in the end to cut spending. He wanted more MX missiles than what Congress ultimately gave him. He didn't get it. He didn't get what he wanted. Give him more power in any area. He's going to use it to accomplish his goals. He would have been in there saying to members of Congress, you want to clean up the Chesapeake Bay? You want that dam or bridge? I'm going to ax it through the line item veto unless you vote for more MX missiles. We get more bridges, more dams, more cleanups, more MX missiles, and more spending. 
Well, the other part of it that's not mentioned very often is he does have that power now. He can exercise a veto on a bill. The argument is, well, gee, but he, there are some areas where, where he supports legislation. Baloney. If presidents want to exercise a veto on a spending bill, uh, they ought to exercise it. This president has been hesitant, Frank, frankly, to exercise the veto on spending bills. Secondly, they ha there is the power to rescind and to send a rescission back to the Congress. That is a power that exists today. If the President wants to rescind funding in a particular area, he can send that rescission to the Congress, and the Congress then uh, has the power to uh, reject or accept it. But he has the power to initiate that. And very frankly, the Congress goes along with most of those rescissions. So the President has the power to exercise a degree of control over it under the present system. That's there for the President to use. John, if I might for a minute, I'd like to get back to, to Dick Cheney's question earlier. If, if a constitutional solution won't work. No, if, if you don't want a constitution. If I don't want a constitution. Okay. If, if, if I start he believing that a constitutional <laughs> solution is not the answer. He said it'll work. Uh, well, I'd, I'd like to see many structural changes. I'd like to see, I think one of the uh, uh, salutary things about the Graham-Rudman notion is having some way of getting a greater concurrence on assumptions between the executive branch and the Congress and taking it out of the realm of politics where it's been for many, many years and where it should <coughs> not be. There are structural areas that can provide, I think, differences at the margins. What to do? I think the idea of a summit differs from the notion of, of a group of people getting together in a room, the Gang of 17 or, or all of the leaders simply getting together and coming up with something. In one very important way, uh, as I suggested earlier, I think a fundamental part of our problem is that you have a public, even though it sees the deficit as the number one issue facing the country. This is not a lapel grabber for people out uh, in, in uh, the country. I would wager even, Dick, that when you go back home to Wyoming and you step off the plane, you don't have a lot of people coming up to you and grabbing your lapels saying, do something and do it now. People are relatively content. One of the first things we've got to do to solve this problem is to send a message to the public that there is a consensus among the elites that this is a terrifying problem that has to be dealt with now. It's not there. The notion of a summit raises it to a different level, I think, and would create a greater consensus and might create a greater consensus among elites. There's not an entire consensus with the President, the House, or the Senate that the deficit is the biggest problem in the country. Norm, if you'd travel with me back to my district, you'd find that there are people waiting when I get off the airplane that <laughs> grab me by the oh. hotel. Well, that's why, I'm like <laughs> that's why I'm a politician. You're a political scientist. <laughs> um, no, I think, I think the level of concern in the nation is definitely there. Uh, I think we've got to spend more time on it. Uh, I think you're right. I think there's a lot that needs to be done with respect to public education. But I'm not prepared at this point to say that, that all we need is this political consensus or negotiated arrangement or leadership and congressional cooperation to solve the problem. I do think the process doesn't work now. I think we're spending an enormous amount of time on it, a subject we haven't even talked about. Yeah. I would think Leon would agree with me that, that uh, one of the things that's appalling about it is we spend all of our time on the budget. We don't yes. get anything else done. Right. Uh, why not consider a, a biennial budget process? Let's go to a two-year instead of an every 12-month cycle. The Constitution would allow a, a two-year cycle. Yes. Um, we could do that. We could save a lot of time so that we'd be doing better oversight on the programs that are there. And uh, maybe uh, we'd find it to be far more efficient and less painful to have to do this only once every 24 months instead of once every 12 months. So there are a lot of things I think we can look at that are procedural changes, some constitutional, some statutory, but we shouldn't reject those out of hand and, and argue that all we need is a political consensus and that'll solve the but problem. I don't think... But now let's, let's get down to particulars. You have introduced an amendment to, to create a biennial budget to your cycle. That's correct. I uh, first introduced this 10 years ago when I was uh, first, first went on the budget committee because I felt even at that time that what we were doing was spending too much time just operating on a crisis basis and dealing with the budget. We'd no sooner complete one budget cycle than we were fighting the battle over the next budget cycle. You had uh, no sooner one set of constituents asking what's happening on education funding than they'd come in and ask what's happening on the next set. We'd have a set of supplementals that would come in in between uh, and it was constant and I frankly view Graham Rudman uh, as turning up the degrees on the budget process about 300 degrees, we're going to be spending a lot more time just dealing with nothing else but budget issues. And it just seems to me, rather than fighting the budget resolution battle every year, that we ought to spend a year in our process doing oversight, looking at programs, looking how, at how effective they are, whether they're working or not, and then spend the next year then appropriating or targeting the funding for those particular areas so that we first of all allow a, a larger time, a larger amount of time for planning. Secondly, 
we can uh, begin to focus a lot more on oversight of existing programs rather than simply operating on a day-to-day -day basis uh, based on trying to save whatever programs are out there, whether they're working or not. And thirdly, I think it would establish a little more stability over a longer time frame than having the kind of chaotic process we have in place now. I, I don't Dr. disagree with the notion of a two-year <laughs> budget cycle, although I, I doubt very much it would have the intended effect. We right now have a budget where we set economic assumptions for a time 21 months in advance. And we spend a lot of the time during the budget cycle tinkering with those assumptions because they have a big effect on what ends up going into the budget. Uh, we know uh, that we aren't uh, perfect even if we make the, the best honest effort at, uh, at that kind of forecasting. I can just imagine what happens if we're setting our assumptions 34 months in advance and what that would do down the road. But I'll, I'll accept that this would be positive and it, and it would be a good step forward. There are many steps that would be a good step forward. Those steps are, are at the margins. They're incremental. They don't get to the gut issues. What worries me about the constitutional changes is I think to a degree the American public have been sold a bill of goods. The notion that if we make a constitutional change or tinker with the structures, we'll solve this problem and it won't hurt. All we have to do is get a constitutional amendment to balance the budget and the budget will end up getting balanced because it's just these people who don't have the guts to take away the waste, fraud, and abuse that doesn't hurt anybody or these programs that only benefit the special interests. And none of us are special interests, of course. We are not beneficiaries of those programs. The basic reality is to balance the budget, to get down to a reasonable figure, which my colleague John Macon, uh, and I agree with him, would say is about 2% of the gross national product. No matter what is going to take painful things that will hurt a lot of people. It'll hurt farmers and all the people around the rural areas who aren't farmers, who benefit from those programs, who don't consider themselves to be special interests. It'll hurt Social Security recipients. It'll hurt those who want a, a, a bigger defense budget. We cannot let people believe that there's a simple answer to this problem, that if we just adjust uh, the structures in a big way or a little way, it's going to solve the problem. It's going to take pain. Norm, I don't disagree with uh, anything you've said, but uh, again, I come back to the basic fundamental notion. Of course it's going to take pain. Of course it's difficult. What we're trying to do is find ways to bias the process more in the direction of those kinds of decisions, <laughs> to make it, to make it uh, possible for us to reach that consensus or those agreements that we aren't reaching at present. And we are willing to tamper with the process in order to do that. <clears throat> the argument, again, that, that there's no change that can be made out there to strengthen the president's hand or the congressional hand or make us be better, better budgeteers, I just don't think it was water. And I don't think the argument that somehow a, a line item veto constitutional amendment uh, wouldn't assist in that process in light of the fact that we use it today in 43 states or that the biennial process wouldn't help. We use that in a number of states today as well. Or that constitutional provisions that relate to the to the relationship between uh, outlays and, and income wouldn't have some positive benefit. It seems to me to fly in the face of 200 years of experience at the state level. We've got a federal system. We've tried a lot of these concepts at the state level. Obviously the federal government's different, but there are a lot of similarities too. And we ought to take advantage of that experience and expertise, see if there aren't ways, in fact, that we can improve the process, improve the procedures, improve the Constitution in ways that would help. Could I just <coughs> mention there are constitutional issues here about line item veto about Graham Rudman kinds of uh, approaches and whatever. It's a set of constraints that we must restrain, that we must stay within. But the, uh, the Act of 1974 arguably transferred some authority from the President, who had some rescission authority, to the Congress. Um, the line item veto would transfer some power, some authority, from the Congress to the President. It has been said that uh, by uh, Phil Graham that one of his objectives was to be neutral with respect to the transfer of authority. So it would put both the President and the Congress on the same plane. And he thought that this was a key to enactment of legislation that would change the institutional arrangements uh, so that uh, the de budget deficit would be dealt with. We have two outstanding members of Congress here. I wonder how they feel about the, the, the notion of the transfer of power. I guess Dick is saying that you do not object to transferring certain authorities uh, to the president, some power from the Congress to the president. But I uh, would, your I colleagues would, agree on that. I would see, for example, uh, something like the line item veto. I don't mean to harp on that, but, but as, a, as a restitution of what was the balance that existed for 100 years and was changed by the 74 Act when we wiped out the impoundment authority of the president. Some of the proposals that have been made, I think, uh, simply restore what 
I believe to be the appropriate balance and I give just, the President I, some additional authority. I just dare say that some people who probably support a line item veto uh, envision that Ronald Reagan will be president forever. Uh, and don't recognize that a Teddy Kennedy it's or another, someone like that that's another can basically uh, uh, work uh, <laughs> exercise <laughs> that, 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 that kind of power. <laughs> 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 it's thanks to the Republicans pushing through the 22nd can, I can see the, 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 I can see the next one. Right. But, you know, again, I just want to get to that bottom line, which is that no matter how you develop the process or the procedure, it still depends a great deal on the willingness of, of people in office to exercise leadership on these issues. Can I tell you what I think is a sad commentary, and, and I, a perplexing one, arguably? And that is, Graham Rudman, of course, requires a decreasing deficit path over five years. I think we'd all agree that trying to eliminate the deficit tomorrow would be a mistake. It decreases it over a period of years. And the way it does that is it requires the president to come in and, and propose a budget at whatever that target level is, and it requires Congress to pass a budget with no greater than that level of deficit. Um, and if they don't, however, there is this sequestering, that is, the sort of across-the-board cuts with Social Security exempted, but across-the-board cuts in other kinds of uh, spending. Now, the drafters of the bill and, and, the, and certainly uh, the president views the sequestering process is the absolute last resort. That's something that we don't want to happen. That's something that uh, would, would take place only if the process failed. But I find it perplexing, arguably amusing, that by far the most debate that has been taken, taken place on Graham Rudman Hollings has been about the sequestering order. What happens if there is sequestering? Now, I once characterized this it's, it's, it's as one of my uh, teenage children on a Saturday morning. I was chatting with them, and I said, well, tonight you must come in by curfew. And if you don't come in by curfew time, you can't watch your favorite TV program on Sunday. And uh, rather than their figuring out the way to get in on curf by curfew, they spend all the rest of the day arguing with me about what the punishment is going to be, the nature of the punishment on Sunday. Why, why doesn't Congress seem to have more self-assurance and self-confidence that the process would work? The process that's incorporated in the ordinary 1970 and the 74 Budget Act, but just the additional of meeting a deficit because, target. Jim, let me, let me answer that, because I think you've raised a very important issue, and in, in the conference on Graham Rudman, uh, this was discussed, because it's not only a club, it's also an escape for members of Congress. Mm -hmm. and the reason is, why should members of Congress vote responsibly for cuts in reconciliation, cuts in appropriations bills, when they in fact can, can go ahead and let this thing hit the wall, assert the trigger, and do it across the board, and allow that process to somehow take the blame? Mm -hmm. uh, that is the danger, it seems to me, in Graham Rudman, is that you're going to get a lot of members who will say, why should I vote for a tough budget that's going to cut Social Security, that's going to cut defense, that's going to raise taxes, when I can simply vote the kind of budget I would prefer, have no budget adopted, have no reconciliation adopted, and then go right to this trigger. That's the danger, is that it really undermines the process. It, does, it creates a club, but it doesn't create a carrot to do the right thing. We have painted a very broad canvas, and with your kind <laughs> permission, I think we should be moving on to the question, <laughs> question and answer session, because we have a, a, an expert and very uh, knowledgeable audience. And may I have the first question, please? I'm Mark Cannon, Staff Director for the Bicentennial Commission. If I understood Professor Ornstein, he uh, suggested there was no institutional congressional bias against uh, deficits, because throughout much of our history, we had either run surpluses or only minor deficits. I think of three major changes, though, between the first century and a half of our history and the last half century. One is that we had a vast amount of land that we were selling that supplied revenues without pain or minimal pain. We had tariffs that supplied substantial revenues without, uh, with minimal pain, uh, at least conceived by the people. And uh, third, that we, uh, until uh, Beardsley Rummel, we never had uh, the painless system of paying taxes, where it's taken out automatically. Uh, let me just say, isn't it really the problem, the almost transcendent problem of a constitutional <coughs> democracy, which is its tendency to uh, sacrifice long-term gain for short-term gain? Okay, let, let me respond to that question in a couple of ways. 
clearly we have had some changes, although I think to suggest that balancing the budget in the, in the uh, 18th or 19th centuries was relatively easy because we had easy sources of revenue through selling land or, uh, or through tariffs um, is uh, not entirely true. If you look at some of the constitutional debates over the budget uh, back during that time, they incurred substantial pain, uh, particularly since they not only had to uh, balance the budget, they felt a driving need to uh, run surpluses, first to overcome the debt from the Revolutionary War, then to overcome the debt from the War of 1812, and on. It was painful. It was difficult. They did overcome uh, the, the, uh, the difficulties and went ahead and, and uh, did it. Most of the changes you've suggested take us up into the early part of this century. And, and in fact, with the exception of the two world wars, right up into the 1960s, we tended to uh, alleviate a substantial portion of the debt that we'd incurred during the wars by running surpluses uh, during portions of that time. I just don't think there is a fundamental feature of the American political system, our constitutional system, that builds in a bias that leads us inexorably to, to run out of control with deficits. We have not run out of control through most of our history, and the changes in the last 20 years, I don't believe, including the reforms that have taken place in Congress, uh, are not such that uh, they, they have created the enormous deficits that we have run, particularly in the last five years. But now, as to uh, the, the uh, uh, second part of your question, isn't it the problem of constitutional democracies uh, that, uh, in fact, we aren't willing to take short-term pain uh, for a long-term gain. I suspect that that is a, a, a flaw or a problem in human nature. There aren't very many people who are willing to take short-term pain for the if-come-maybe uh, of a long-term gain. Representative Cheney? Yeah, I, I think there's one other point that needs to be made here. There are a whole bunch of programs that are on the books now that simply weren't on the books in 1960 that Congress put there, oftentimes with presidential, uh, responding to presidential initiative or support. 1960, we didn't have a Medicaid program. We didn't have a Medicare program. Social Security was still relatively modest in those days. We didn't have that many people drawing benefits. We didn't have a food stamp program. We didn't have aid to elementary and secondary education. Those are all 1960s programs that were put on the books then with enormous increase in funding in the 60s and the 1970s. All right, next question, please. Yes, sir. Herman Belts from the University of Maryland. One of the issues that's unclear is how alarmed and how concerned public opinion is about the deficits. A second uh, issue that hasn't been clarified so much as I think it might be is that the federal government, as it has taken the place of the states, as it has superseded the states as the primary provider, the primary regulator of everyday life, employment, uh, welfare, education, and so forth, as the federal government does that, there's necessarily going to be a uh, need for a constitutional adjustment so that the federal government can uh, handle the budgetary process the way the states have handled the budgetary process. That seems to involve uh, governors having the uh, line item veto. It involves longer, more detailed, more legislative-like constitutions where people will put into their constitutions things that uh, we at the national level regard as legislative, but they're increasingly going to have to be dealt with in the Constitution. And my question is, what is wrong with the people as the constituent power acting to change the constitutional system and make the adjustment that I speak about, what's wrong with the people demanding that this be done? All right, you two uh, have the first shot. Take your choice. Which one of you Well, no, no, one, uh, no one disagrees with the public doing whatever they want on the issue. I, uh, nobody's going to stop the public or the states from, in fact, proceeding if, in fact, what they want is a constitutional amendment. I just don't think the public ought to be uh, under the false assumption that by passing a balanced budget amendment that that's going to solve the problem of the deficit or solve the problem of the balance between federal and state governments. That just is not the case. The fact is, under any balanced budget amendment approach that I've seen, uh, and uh, you know, that, that's the only ones we're working with right now, uh, are those that, uh, that are before the Congress, under any of those proposals, I see a few hundred ways to get around them. You can take things off budget. You can basically uh, uh, play within the context of any amendment so that the, the bottom line result is that deficits continue to go up and we still continue to play the same games. I just don't want to uh, convince people that, uh, that this is somehow a magic answer. All right, Dr. Ornstein. Let me talk about the notion of the states and the fact that we ought to adopt all kinds of provisions that the states have because of the way that they've operated in the past. 
Uh, the federal government is, of course, different in many ways. Uh, if we're going to do that, maybe we ought to give authority over uh, national defense to governors in some fashion and make that kind of a trade-off. Obviously, we don't want to do that. Our system at the federal level is a very different one. Now, what lessons can we learn from the states? Most of the information we have, and we're now getting some significant detail on how line-item vetoes have worked in the states, do not suggest that they've resulted in significant or dramatic savings. And let me add that most states which brag that they have constitutional provisions to balance the budget and governors go around the country bragging that they've made the tough decisions, almost every one of these states eliminates from their budgets capital expenditures. They include operating expenditures, not expenditures that are made for longer term capital reasons. The federal government doesn't do that. If we act the way the states did, if we took out what the Office of Management and Budget has defined every year in the budget as capital expenditures, we wouldn't have a problem. We could say, hey, we're very close to balancing the budget. All of us could come to an agreement on how we would balance what's left. The problem would still remain. States do not balance their budgets. They take items like highways and buildings and automobiles and take them off the budget and finance them through bonds, and which of course means incurring debt, and say we're balancing the budget. There isn't an appropriate analogy with the states, and we do not have evidence that what has worked in the states has in fact worked the way that they suggest, or that it would work in the federal government. Representative Cheney? I, I don't want to, to uh, belabor the point. I think uh, that all wisdom does not reside in Washington. I think we've got 50 states out there that uh, have a wealth of experience uh, that we ought to be willing to look at, and that there are bright, able people serving as governors and state legislatures who've got uh, some, some lessons that perhaps they'd be willing to share with us, and to suggest that somehow provisions that have been in force at the state level, in some cases for 200 years, cannot be applied at the federal level, it seems to me is ludicrous on its face. I think there's a lot that we can learn from uh, the states and how they go about their budget process. I think Norm is right. Uh, there is a capital budget problem. Uh, uh, some states uh, are find it easier to meet their constitutional uh, balanced budget requirement by using capital budgets, but I think there's a lot there we can learn. All right, next question. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Robert Goldwyn of the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, the power of the purse, uh, uh, that is where it is placed in any uh, regime, is a very good indication of how that society is constituted. Uh, there was a great fear uh, of letting the executive have access to the purse. Uh, that, that was always the, uh, the signpost of uh, tyranny. Uh, any executive who could get public money uh, without having it appropriated by law uh, had it, all the earmarks of a tyrant. The um, the whole idea of giving the power of purse to Congress is that those who are most di directly elected uh, by the people are the ones who um, are most accountable and who uh, can be kept track of uh, when it comes to the spending of, of public money. But our experience seems to be, um, whether it's an institutional bias or a temporary situation or wh whatever, that Congress doesn't do a very good job uh, in handling the power of the purse and that the executive branch has a kind of expertise, but we don't trust them with it. Now the question then is, is there some way to combine <coughs> trustworthiness and capability, um, whether it's by uh, unusual leadership or a new spirit of cooperation or some new devices, to combine these two so that they can be trusted and capable? Anybody? You guys want to take a shot first? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I mean, I, I Let's don't. Let's let the spokesman for the tyrant uh, go ahead. <laughs> well, on, on behalf of all tyrants, I, um, I think a key point was made earlier by uh, my colleagues on at the other end of the table. I think Mr. Panetta said it rather well. Barbara Conable, a former distinguished member of the House, has, has argued it over the years, and that is that that uh, the system responds in a crisis, and oftentimes these kinds of difficult decisions don't get made until there is a crisis. And uh, I, uh, I think if uh, the Founding Fathers uh, wanted an efficient mechanism, obviously they would have created a very different system than they created. I think uh, that public opinion is growing enough, and that the concern is great enough,
that within the next few years there's no question but what we're going to have to come to grips with the problem and that a national consensus will have to be developed and we'll do it through procedure or summit meetings or the ultimate compromise. But I, I don't think you can look at the problems today and not assume we're ultimately going to get there. I don't think there's any um, sort of automatic fix on the system. I think there are a bunch of marginal fixes that would, would help and would make it easier. Um, I think, uh, as I've argued, that uh, changing the process would help. I think constitutional amendments or modifications would indeed help. But in the end, it's going to take, uh, as Norma suggested and Leon and Jim, uh, it's going to take uh, that national sense of, of concern that this is more important than any other problem we face, and then we will come to grips with the issue. Just as we did a few years ago with Social Security, when uh, we reached the point where the system was about to go belly up, then we came together, administration and Congress, and, and worked out a solution. Dr. Miller? Could I say, and, and I probably, uh, Dick would not disagree with this, in the overall context, and when you're talking about uh, uh, organizations of government, I think that our founding fathers did provide us with a very efficient decision-making process. That's a decision-making process that, that translates the demands of ordinary citizens into government goods and services. I mean, a tyrant or any of the others uh, would be very inefficient. They might make decisions quickly, but those decisions wouldn't be very carefully meshed with those of the people. So I think the system is efficient. On the question of expertise, one major advantage, I think, of the 1974 Act was the setting up of the Congressional Budget Office, headed now by Rudy Penner, former uh, fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, that has provided an enormous amount of extra expertise to the budget committees and to other members of uh, Congress uh, for their oversight of uh, activities. And if there's right. a problem, it's a problem with, with uh, I think, a, a misinformed public. If you ask the public, I would guess, what is in the budget, uh, you'd probably have them say that uh, $600 toilet <coughs> seats and $7,000 coffee makers make up uh, about a third of the defense budget and probably uh, a sixth of the budget overall, that waste, fraud, abuse, and welfare programs uh, make up at least half of what remains of the budget, and that essential services are what's left. Uh, the, uh, the real uh, makeup of the budget, the 85 percent figure that Leon suggested, I think, is not something that most Americans are aware of. And if they were, they'd have a different perspective on this issue. Time is our master here, whatever masters of the budget may exist. And this, I'm sorry to say, concludes another public policy forum presented by the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research. On behalf of AEI, our hearty thanks to the distinguished and expert members of the panel, Representative Dick Cheney, the Office of Management and Budget Director, Dr. James C. Miller III, Representative Leon E. Panetta of California, and Dr. and Professor Norman Ornstein uh, all of you have our thanks, as do the guests and the experts in our audience, for their participation. Goodbye from Washington. It is the aim of AEI to clarify issues of the day by presenting many viewpoints in the hope that by doing so, those who wish to learn about the decision-making process will benefit from such a free exchange of informed and enlightened opinion. This public policy forum series is created and supplied to this station as a public service by the American Enterprise Institute, Washington, D.C. AEI is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, publicly supported research and education organization. For a transcript of this program, send $3.75 to the American Enterprise Institute, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036.